The United States has unveiled its new B-21 Raider bomber. Uh, and, well, let's, let's just see how the Western media reports it. This is from NPR. Pentagon debuts its new stealth bomber, the B-21 Raider, and that is an artist rendition of the B-21 because it hasn't even flown yet. So they're unveiling something that has not taken off. It's not even really done being reviewed and tested. Uh, it still has a long way to go before it goes operational. This is what NPR says. America's newest nuclear stealth bomber is making the, its public debut after years of secret development and as part of the Pentagon's answer to rising concerns over a future conflict with China. So this was an answer to a rising China, and it's something that is, is not even airworthy, is not even flown, and it will not for a, a couple of years still then it's a PR stunt and it's a, a replacement for actual substance. And in reality, this is a massive waste of money and resources. It will do absolutely nothing to give the United States an edge in a battle against China or Russia or any country with an integrated air defense system. Uh, and I'm going to explain all of that here in just a minute, but I do want to explain before I get into all of the details, how this is the perfect example of how the United States and its allies may be spending much more on military capabilities, defense spending, than its adversaries, Russia, China, the rest of the world combined. But it is an example of how even though you're spending more money on a weapon system, it does not actually mean it is a better weapon system. It's how you're spending that money, not how much of it that you're spending. That's very important. And the B-21 Raider is a perfect illustration of what is wrong with Western defense spending and how it's possible to outspend Russia many times over and still fall short on, or in this case, over the battlefield. So the NPR article continues. It says the B-21 Raider is the first new American bomber aircraft in more than 30 years. Almost every aspect of the program is classified ahead of its unveiling Friday at an Air Force facility in Palmdale, California, only artists' ren renderings of the warplane have been released. Those few images reveal that the radar resembles the black nuclear stealth bomber. It will eventually replace the B-2 Spirit. And the B-2 Spirit really does look almost exactly like this. There are some differences, but more or less it's... So if you remember a plane that looked similar to that, that is the B-2. It also says in a fact sheet, Northrop Grumman, based in Falls Church, Virginia, said it's using new manufacturing techniques and materials to ensure the B-21 will defeat the anti-access area denial systems it will face. When they're talking about anti-access area denial, or A2AD, they're talking about the United States carrying out military aggression against another nation and needing to penetrate its defense systems, air defense systems specifically. And in this regard, they're talking about penetrating Russian and Chinese air defense systems, which is extremely unlikely to happen. And even the Western analysts uh, advocating for the B-21 Raider, uh, even they, when they explain about this weapons program, seem to lack confidence that it can actually do that. But uh, this is the real selling points, uh, I think, of this B-21 Raider. NPR explains, the cost of the bombers is unknown. The Air Force previously put the price for a buy of 100 aircraft at an average cost of $550 million each in 2010 dollars, or roughly $753 million today. But it's unclear how much the Air Force is actually spending. The fact that the price is not public troubles government watchdogs. And if it's like any other weapons program ever pursued by the United States, it's going to likely go far over whatever the Air Force claimed it was going to cost. So it's a huge money-making gimmick. You could even call it a scam, possibly. And that's about it. And uh, the article even admits that the ambitions the U.S. has regarding the B-21 Raider uh, are very similar to the B-2 
which remain unfulfilled to this day. So this is what it says. The B-2 was also envisioned to be a fleet of more than 100 aircraft, but the Air Force ultimately built only 21 of them due to cost overruns and a changed security environment after the Soviet Union fell. And uh, the article itself admits that the B-21 radar has, has never flown. It will not fly the earliest. Uh, it will fly is sometime next year at the earliest. Uh, and it still requires a critical design review. This is an extensive process. And so it would, again, it will not be operational for another couple of years. So how this is an answer to China now uh, baffles me, quite frankly. And, and by the time it is operational, Russia and China will both be using uh, the next iteration of their respective air defense systems. Uh, so whatever, this aircraft is designed to do in regards to S-400 air defense systems, by, by the time it's actually operational, it'll be going up against S-500 and beyond. Uh, and more than that, not just newer air defense systems, but updated versions of the S-300 and S-400, that is a process that is continuous. And then uh, improvements in how all of these air defense systems are networked together, not only among the S- uh, 300, 400, 500 air defense systems, but all the shorter range systems that are integrated in what is a tiered air defense network that, that the Russians and also the Chinese maintain. So already at face value, this comes across as uh, a money-making scheme uh, by the US military industrial complex, uh, again, at the expense of producing more practical weapons and in larger quantities, which we can see is what you actually need on a modern battlefield. We see this playing out in Ukraine right now. And I want to point out this paper from RUSI, Royal United Services Institute. It's titled Preliminary Lessons in Conventional Warfighting from Russia's Invasion of Ukraine, February to July 2022. And security analyst Mark Sloboda pointed this out to me. And this article, this paper says, warfighting demands large initial stockpiles and significant slack capacity. Evidently, no country in NATO other than the US has sufficient initial weapon stocks for warfighting or the industrial capacity to sustain large scale operations. This must be rectified if deterrence is to be credible and is equally a problem for uh, the Royal Air Force and the Royal Navy because Rusi is a British government sponsored think tank. So does this bomber that costs over $700 million each. At, at most, they will build 100 of them, most likely far fewer. Does that sound like it fits into this realization that the West is now coming to regarding the necessity for massive industrial capacity, large quantities of, of weapons that you can continuously supply to a modern battlefield? No, it, it does not. 100 of anything, uh, doesn't seem like a lot when you're talking about moving it anywhere near an active battlefield and the possibility of it being shot down. And a lot of Western analysts are talking about the B-21 Raider, uh, explaining how it's going to be fitted out with long range weapons. And long range weapons are usually used for standoff attacks where you're firing these weapons uh, beyond the range of your adversary's air defense systems and even their ability to quickly scramble warplanes to intercept your bombers. Uh, so if you're be beyond the range of air defenses and enemy aircraft, why do you need the stealth capability? Why do you need a $700 million aircraft to launch standoff weapons uh, well outside uh, an, an area where you would be in any danger of being detected and shot down? In contrast, Russia, Russia has a variety of strategic bombers. They have the Tupolev Tu-95. It is a propeller-driven aircraft that was originally designed in the 1950s, and they, they still use them to this day. They have a extremely long range, and they can fire standoff weapons well outside of uh, the range of, say, Ukrainian air defenses, or uh, well outside the range of any remaining Ukrainian aircraft that could potentially intercept it. It does not need stealth capabilities because it's going nowhere near 
where it could be detected and shot down. Uh, Russia also has the Tupolev Tu-160 and the Tupolev Tu-22M. These are uh, strategic bombers, uh, jet bombers, and uh, they have a shorter range, but they can get to uh, an area where they will launch these standoff weapons much faster. And they also do not require stealth capabilities because they are well outside the range of enemy air defenses and well outside the range of where uh, interceptor aircraft could reach them. And they are a fraction, a tiny, tiny fraction of the cost of this B-21 Raider. And even air forces that have current stealth aircraft, say the United States and Israel, uh, fighting in and around Syria. They have uh, the F-35, and the U.S. also has the uh, F-22. These are both supposedly stealth. And yet, when they are carrying out strikes against targets in Syria, they are also using a standoff strategy, using standoff munitions. So I want to show you uh, some articles about this. This is from Breaking Defense. Israel shifts to standoff weapons in Syria as Russian threats increase. The change comes as Russia says it has stopped using a deconfliction line with Israel. And it says defense sources say the Israeli military is planning to change its tactics in Syria to revolve around long-range standoff munitions as opposed to airstrikes following a new Russian policy to use its higher-end air defense systems capable of shooting down Israeli jets over Syrian airspace. Israel has F-35s, which are supposedly stealth. And uh, they could continue carrying out airstrikes uh, closer to the targets uh, that they're interested in if they were confident that that stealth capability would evade Russian air defense systems. And, and they're not, so they're doing standoff attacks. You don't need an F-35 to carry out standoff attacks. You, you need any type of aircraft at all that is capable of bringing these long-range weapons up into the air. And that's it. Here's another example, this time about U.S. military operations around Syria. This is from Air and Space Forces magazine, Syria strike story shifting. And it says, in a briefing for reporters on April 14th, Joint, Joint Staff Director Lieutenant General Kenneth McKenzie said he did not know what U.S. fighters escorted B-1s on the raid, acknowledging fighters were there, but not specifically identifying the F-22. Later, Pentagon spokesman said B-1B bombers, which launched the JSOMs, were escorted by Marine Corps EA-6B Prowler escort jamming aircraft. Neither the Pentagon nor AFSEN has recanted that information. In an April 19th Pentagon press briefing, McKenzie said a contingent of fighter aircraft flying out of U.S. Air Force bases in Europe provided protective overwatch of the USS Donald Cook in the Eastern Mediterranean during the strikes, but the ship was not threatened by Russian frigates in the region. Eyewitness reports have pegged those aircraft as F-15Cs. Pentagon spokesman Lieutenant Colonel Damian Pickard told Military.com on Monday the standoff capabilities of the JSOMs was considered sufficient to minimize risk to air crews and aircraft. The F-22, he said, was available but wasn't required for their operation as planned. So again, the United States has stealth capabilities, but they prefer to use this strategy of launching standoff strikes instead uh, because it's basically almost foolproof uh, and they're going up against very advanced air defense systems that could potentially see an F-22 or an F-35 and shoot it out of the sky. And it should be added that the B-1B bomber has, it's not, it's not technically a stealth aircraft, but it has many features that, are, that it shares in common with stealth aircraft. It has material that's supposed to absorb uh, radar. It's also uh, shaped a certain way that helps minimize its cross-section. Uh, but even then, they're still using it uh, to c carry out these standoff attacks well outside the range of air defense systems in and around Syria. If you understand that this approach, carrying out standoff strikes, it's something the U.S. does, Israel does, Russia is doing it in Ukraine. This is a strategy that is very practical. It depends on having a large quantity 
of standard munitions rather than a small handful of extremely sophisticated, uh, extremely expensive aircraft that may or may not evade enemy radar. And it is getting the job done, more or less. When you, you have uh, standard munitions, long range munitions, you fire them, they can be intercepted. If you fire them in large enough quantities, you will saturate an, the enemy's air defenses and a certain number of missiles will get through. Again, this is what Russia is doing in Ukraine. They're firing large numbers of missiles. They know a certain number of them will be shot down. They also know a certain number of them will get through Ukrainian air defenses and hit their targets. They're also, uh, according to British claims, uh, using these old Soviet era nuclear cruise missiles, removing the nuclear warhead, obviously, putting an inert ballast in its place, and using them to force Ukrainians to target and expend air defense munitions on them while more modern cruise missiles find and hit their targets. And so this is, this is obviously a highly effective, very economical way to wage war versus this B-21 Raider at over $700 million per aircraft. And uh, claiming that you're going to have 100, but probably having 10 or 20 of them in reality. So what, what do Western analysts and industry insiders say about the B-21 Raider? Do they have anything to say about it that contradicts my, my conclusion that it's a huge waste of money, that you, you can get the same results by using standoff tactics, which can uh, be done with almost any aircraft in, in America's current inventory? Uh, well, this is an article from the national interest. You're wondering what would happen if the new B-21 Raider, if it ever takes off, how how will it fare against Russia's S-400 air defense system? And the article says, critical reviews of the emerging B-21 design are essential to engineering a platform able to accommodate the most advanced current and anticipated future stealth priorities, which include stealth coding, and configuration, radar cross-section reduction, and heat signature suppression technologies, among other things. Then it says, a new generation of stealth technology is being pursued with a sense of urgency in light of rapid global modernization of new Russian and Chinese-built air defense technologies, advances in computer processing, digital networking technology, and targeting systems now enable air defenses to detect even stealth aircraft with, with much greater effectiveness, which is why Israel and the US have stealth aircraft, but they're using standoff tactics uh, in regards to Syria says russian built s-300 and s-400 air defense weapons believed by many to be among the best in the world and that includes western analysts they consider it the best in the world or among the best in the world it says are able to use digital technology to network nodes to one another to pass tracking and targeting data across wide swaths of terrain new air defenses also use advanced command and control technology to detect aircraft across a much wider spectrum of frequencies than previous systems could. This technical trend has ignited global debates about whether stealth te technology itself could become obsolete. Not so fast, says a recent Mitchell Institute essay, The Imperative for Stealth, which makes a lengthy case for a continued need for advanced stealth platforms. Of course, the Mitchell Institute is funded by the arms industry, including corporations that make stealth aircraft, including Lockheed Martin. I don't see uh, Northrop Grumman on the list, but of course, uh, this, is, this is an organization that would be deeply invested in convincing people that these extremely expensive, small quantity, extremely expensive products were necessary because it is what is going to maximize profit versus uh, retooling your production, investing heavily in production and churning out large quantities of cheap weapons. Uh, this is much more uh, profitable for, these, for this entire industry, not just Northrop Grumman. So this is how they're going to try to uh, argue that this massive investment in 100 planes at, at the most, but, but likely much fewer than that, how it's somehow worth it. So this is what they say. 
Given the increased threat envelope created by cutting edge air defenses and the acknowledgement that stealth aircraft are indeed much more vulnerable than when they first emerged, Air Force developers are increasingly viewing stealth capacity as something which includes a variety of key parameters. This includes not only stealth configuration, IR suppression, and radar evading materials, but also other important elements such as electronic warfare jamming defenses, operating during adverse weather conditions to lower the acoustic signature, and conducting attacks in tandem with other less stealthy aircraft, likely to command attention from enemy air defense systems. So they're talking about decoys. They're talking about using all of these other strategies that you would use for standoff attacks. Uh, and this somehow is the justification for creating these extremely expensive stealth aircraft by using them in exactly the same way you use uh, conventional aircraft to, to conduct standoff attacks. And if that's what you're going to do, you don't need the stealth capability. This is the whole point. So the article says, given these factors, Air Force developers often refer to stealth configuration itself as merely one arrow in the quiver of approaches needed to defeat modern air defenses. Uh, and then the article concludes by talking about how the B-21 Raider will carry long range weapons. <laughs> so I, again, they're, they're admitting that it's going to be used in this, uh, most likely it's going to be used uh, for standoff attacks, which means you don't even need the stealth capability to begin with. Very little about what the advocates of the B-21 Raider have said indicate that it'll actually be able to do. Uh, what did the NPR article say? Defeat the anti-access area denial systems it will face. I see no indication that it could actually do that. What I see even its advocates saying is that it'll just be used like uh, conventional uh, warplanes are used to conduct standoff attacks. It is a huge sum of money that could have been used to produce large quantities of conventional weapons and aircraft uh, that could just as easily carry out these standoff strikes, uh, do so for much less money and free up money for other capabilities on the battlefield. It'll all be soaked up uh, by Northrop Grumman for a small number of these aircraft that really are not providing any capability that will give the US uh, the edge in, in, a, in any kind of conflict with either Russia or China or any other nation using integrated air defense systems designed and built by Russia or China. So if you're wondering why someone like me always talks about uh, the US falling short in this proxy war of theirs against Russia and Ukraine, despite them by far outspending Russia. A, a lot of people say, Brian, uh, Russia, uh, you, the US defense budget is massive, it's gargantuan. How do, you think, how do you think it's possible that they could run out of ammunition or run out of heavy weapons to send Ukraine? I don't believe it. Well, believe it because they, they may be outspending Russia, but they are spending that money on things like the B-21 Raider. It is overpriced, it, it does not it does not serve a purpose that conventional aircraft can't. It does not afford the U.S. a capability that Russia doesn't already have in abundance. And uh, while the B-21 Raider is an extreme example of this type of waste, it is a pattern that repeats itself all throughout the U.S. arms industry. If you thought this video was useful, please like and share. Think about subscribing. It's free to do. It helps the channel grow. Check the video description below for other places you can find and follow my work. All my YouTube videos are uploaded on Odyssey and Rumble automatically. It might take a day or two, but they'll show up. Subtitles for all of my videos, uh, uh, YouTube videos are automatically generated. I have no control over when that happens. Thank you for your patience while you wait, but they, they will eventually show up. In the video description, I've included all of the links that I've referenced, as well as for ways you can help support my work. I do not monetize my YouTube channel. If an ad pops up, please feel free to just skip it because it's not helping me at all. Uh, if you do want to support my work, please do so through Patreon and buy me a coffee. I cannot use PayPal any longer. Uh, they are making it impossible for, for people to use, just ordinary people They continuously uh, change the type of accounts that you can and cannot use under all sorts of different circumstances. So it's just better not to use it at all. They also have uh, a bad habit of 
deplatforming people simply because of their political beliefs. So I, I think um, good riddance for PayPal. Uh, so again, if you want to support my work, please do so through uh, Patreon. And if you don't want to support me month to month, you can do one-time donations through Buy Me A Coffee. And to everyone who has been helping out, thank you so much. I couldn't do this work without that support. Uh, and as always, thank you for watching.